What a year. 2021 has not been easy. Also not here in the city of Rome. Despite the pandemic, our team at the Vatican Bureau has tried to keep you informed about the Holy Father and the developments of the Holy See. Every week we sought to surprise you with the beauty of the church that becomes visible, especially right here at its heart. Together, we'll witness again the Pope's apostolic journey to Iraq. We'll look back at the first exhibit after the COVID lockdown in the Vatican Museums. We'll retrace the steps of US President Joe Biden when he visited the Vatican during the G20 summit in Rome. All this now in Vaticano. Early on March the 5th, Pope Francis boards this Alitalia airplane in Rome with 73 journalists from 15 different countries, all destined for Baghdad, Iraq, for a landmark three and a half day visit. Greeting the journalists shortly into the voyage, the Pope says that this trip is emblematic that it is a duty to the land that has been martyred for so many years. Four and a half hours later, he's on the ground, the first Pope ever to set foot in these lands. Iraq's Prime Minister is there to greet him, as are top Iraqi church officials. With a massive armed escort, he takes to the streets of the city, veins that carry the wounds of war. At certain points along the route, Iraqi citizens come out to welcome the successor of Peter to their nation. At the presidential palace, President Bahram Sali stands with him, an image of peace amidst high security. These two lucky children welcome the Holy Father, a pilgrim of peace seeking fraternity and reconciliation. This is how Pope Francis referred to himself before coming. Meeting with 150 Iraqi representatives of civil society and government, Pope Francis says the religious, cultural and ethnic diversity in Iraqi society is a precious resource. He makes an appeal to the authorities to grant all religious communities recognition, respect, rights and protection. Afterwards, the Holy Father meets privately with the President and his wife, where he gives them a medallion emblazoned with the figure of Abraham as a gift, a symbol of the trip.
Hey guys. Hey guys. Thank you. Thank you. To end the day, the Pope goes to visit the site of one of the worst attacks against Christians in Iraq's recent history. The Syrio Catholic Cathedral of Our Lady of Salvation, where in 2010, 48 Catholics were killed while at Mass. While the Pope makes his way through Baghdad, the cathedral is already packed with the religious and priests awaiting the meeting with their pastor. I think that uh, it's a blessing for the Iraqi population. They suffer a lot. And uh, the visit of the Pope to tell us that we are all brothers and sisters, the same God. Do you think it will bring some healing in the country? It's not magic. We have to, to, to work so that uh, this, uh, this union will be uh, perfect. And these religious brothers and sisters should know they've been working on the front lines trying to heal the wounds of war, inspired by the heroism of the martyrs. There are joyful shouts and music as the Pope walks through the courtyard. One person with special needs said afterwards it was a dream come true for them. Inside, Pope Francis speaks to a cross-section of the Catholic leadership of the country, bishop, priests, religious, seminarians and catechists, of the great sacrifice they've made in keeping the Christian faith alive in Iraq. May your witness, matured through adversity and strengthened by the blood of the martyrs, be a shining light in Iraq and beyond in order to proclaim the greatness of the Lord and to make the spirit of this people rejoice in God our Savior. 60% of the Iraqi population is under 25 years of age, and Pope Francis urges the community to help cultivate the future for them, saying they are the country's treasure. The Holy Father leaves the Syro-Catholic Cathedral passing by the statue of Our Lady of Salvation that witnessed the martyrdom a decade prior. A poignant reminder that from the worst of times and from the worst of situations, hope can return and the faith will prevail. Thanks for watching. Stick around for more on Vaticano. The Vatican Museums have inaugurated the first special exhibition in almost two years due to COVID-19 pandemic restrictions. It's a day of joy. It's a day of um, restarting and uh, I'm very, very happy uh, to uh, finally have the possibility to, to inaugurate this exhibition. Director of the Vatican Museums, Barbara Yatta, explains that the Saints Peter and Paul by Raphael and Fra Bartolomeo exhibition is a way to conclude celebrations of the 500th Jubilee of Raphael and underline the strong ties between Rome and Florence. One of the most important artists. Eike Schmidt, director of the Uffizi Galleries in Florence, says the exhibition is a time machine 
that allows visitors to travel 500 years into the past and step into Fra Bartolomeo's and Raphael's studios. It's truly amazing to have these two cartoons next to the painting. The very first time uh, since the winter of 1513, 1514, so more than half a millennium ago, that these four works of art are being brought together in one room. But moreover, since they are clean, since they're conserved, we can really see them um, in a way that uh, would never have been possible in the recent decades or centuries. Fra Bartolomeo was able to finish his painting of St. Paul, but because of an artistic crisis, he never finished the St. Peter piece. The research done during the restoration confirmed that Raphael finished his friend's commission of the figure of St. Peter. And you don't have to really know a lot about Raphael's or Fra Bartomeu's style. You just have to have open eyes uh, in order to really observe what's the same, what's different. Just comparing the cartoon with the final painting, you will be able to see and you will become an expert without reading long uh, texts and long books, uh, just by looking very, very carefully. So um, in the face of St. Peter, in fact, if you look especially at the faces and you will see how um, the cartoon is being uh, transferred in, in, uh, and transformed into something else. And here we do have the ultimate proof that what the written sources tell us, in fact, that um, Raphael finished uh, the painting, is actually fully borne out by their visual characteristics. It's a tiny but very, very important and precious exhibition. Important in many aspects, not only the devotion side. They are the Prince of Apostles, uh, the patrons of Rome, Peter and Paul, that uh, uh, are kept generally in, in the apartment of the audience of popes. And uh, for that reason, it's very, very difficult to see. The, the general public cannot see them. And so we thought uh, uh, it was nice to share uh, these very, very important paintings uh, with a more wide public in occasion of the celebrations of Raphael. The in-depth studies of the paintings fully confirm the double authorship and hence the deep artistic friendship between Raphael and Fra Bartolomeo. Visitors can admire the newly restored masterpieces thanks to the donation of the New York chapter of the Patrons of the Arts of the Vatican Museums and for the first time in 500 years can see the complete process of creating these masterpieces from drawings and preparatory cartoons to paintings. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. We're here right next to the Vatican. It is the smallest country in the world with a land mass of only 0.2 square miles. But it's also the administrative center of the Catholic Church, which at least in Western countries is losing members. The mainstream media often references 
not only decreasing numbers of churchgoers, but also a marginalization when it comes to social norms and values. Yet, the Vatican is considered one of the most influential states in the world. A report from the U.S. Embassy to the Holy See from 2013 highlights the huge political importance of the Vatican. The Holy See is unique to the world in its ability to pursue its own agenda. The Vatican, with its diplomatic relations counting 180 countries, is second only to the United States. And this importance was on display during the G20 summit in Rome. While the Vatican was not invited to the meeting of the 20 most powerful countries in the world, the most important guests of the conference made sure to pay reverence to the Holy Father while in Rome. We're here in front of St. Peter's on the day that U.S. President Joe Biden will meet the Holy Father right before the G20 summit taking place here in Rome. With me is Hannah Brockhaus from Catholic News Agency, a Vatican expert and who's written a lot about um, the Vatican and the, the diplomatic ties uh, with other countries. Is that something that you see as very unusual that the U.S. president is coming to the Pope before he participates in the G20 summit? And what does that mean for diplomacy at the Holy See? Um, it's not unusual, obviously visits between presidents, prime ministers, heads of states and government with uh, the Pope is something that happens frequently. Um, often it even happens a second or third time during a uh, person's uh, um, time in position. The, the G20 summit brings together world leaders to discuss very important future topics for our world really. The Vatican will not be participating in this, however, the, some of the leaders of the most important countries in the world today will visit the Holy Father. Does that mean that the Vatican is still very important for diplomatic work? Yes, absolutely. Um, you'll notice with the topics that these leaders are bringing uh, on their agenda to speak with Pope Francis, they want to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic, um, poverty around the world, as well as the global climate crisis. And you'll see that those are issues that are reflected then also in the agenda for the G20. So you'll notice that the, they want the opinion of the Holy Father. They want to speak to him about these issues. And then hopefully there in the G20, maybe we'll see some of the Pope's um, ideas reflected there. It's, um, I think Hannah Brockhaus from the Catholic News Agency is not the only expert on the Vatican who sees a continuation of the prominence of the Vatican's soft power. Vaticanist Andrea Gagliarducci from Aci Stampa is also convinced that the influence of the Vatican diplomatic corps is at best underestimated. He sees the Holy See's biggest strength as providing a platform for other states to interact and collaborate. On the visit of U.S. President Joseph Biden with the Holy Father, Gagliarducci said, It's kind of interesting that he came and met the Pope in the same day as uh, the Korean President Moon. I mean, it was by chance. They were both here, but President Moon already met the Pope in 2018. But there is another issue ongoing. The Pope could go to North Korea. There had been rumors that the Pope wanted to go. It's interesting because the U.S. and Korea are very much connected in this push to have the Pope in North Korea. When President Biden was elected, the former uh, Korean ambassador to the Holy See wrote uh, an article in which he explained that Biden and Moon had a phone talk and talked about the Pope and the possibility for the Pope to go to North Korea. So that's how the Holy See becomes a center. Uh, for any kind of initiative that can be diplomatic, but at the same time part of this, the so-called third track diplomacy. So an informal diplomacy with a state that is the Holy See that has no interest, no commercial interest, no economic interest, and so it, it can be a player of mediation. <laughs> The lack of economic and military power is something that many experts see as strength rather than a weakness when it comes to the Vatican's diplomatic impact. Edward Penton, who covers the Holy See for the National Catholic Register, the U.S. largest Catholic newspaper, stresses the importance of the Pope himself. Well, I think um, the, the papacy, the Vatican, has always been uh, a, a certain uh, hub, if you like, for, for international relations because of its neutrality, because of its 
good offices. A lot of nations want to use the, the Holy See's good offices in order to, to help their own diplomatic positions around the world. And that's um, something that uh, is also dependent on the, on the Pope as well, because the Pope is very, can be very influential. He can be very much, uh, uh, as John Paul was, a rather sort of colossus on the world stage. And that was very effective in, in, in boosting the profile of the Holy See in terms of helping um, bring nations together to, to, to dialogue, to, to find other means of, of diplomacy rather than, than conflict or, or economic sanctions and so forth. So, so that's really uh, uh, the Vatican, the Holy See's uh, approach to interna international relations, and that's why it's so respected and continues to be to, to a large extent. Yeah. Penton also believes that it is the moral weight that makes the real difference, more so than economic or military power. What the Holy See brings to the international scene is not, of course, military power, economic power. Those are the elements, of course, it doesn't have. But what it does have is, is moral weight, and it can bring a lot of moral weight and moral suasion to international relations. And that is why uh, a lot of nations around the world like it because they often want to, if you like, to put it crudely, they, they rather want to co-opt that for their own causes. So if, for example, a nation is very concerned about climate change, for example, and they see that the Holy See is also uh, concerned about climate change, which it is, then they can sort of co-opt the Holy See to add weight, to moral weight, to that position. And that is, that is why uh, a lot of nations a lot of governments see, see the Holy See as, as a, great, a great asset, really, in their, in their di diplomacy. Diplomatic influence is always a means to an end, and never an end in itself. There are many instances showing that the Vatican uses its power for the greater good. With diplomatic ties to more than 180 countries in the world, the Holy See continues to be an important global actor, using its diplomatic impact for promoting significant international issues. It represents the interests of more than a billion Catholics around the world. And therefore, it is right and just that its voice is being heard from the tomb of St. Peter's across the world. For EWTN Vaticano, Andreas Tonhauser. Thank you for revisiting with us the year of 2021. It's my heartfelt wish that you will have a blessed new year filled with hope and love. Our team at the EWTN Vatican Bureau will make sure to keep you updated on everything happening here in the Eternal City and to bring unfiltered information about the Pope, the Church, and its sheer beauty into your home, wherever that may be. From St. Peter's Square, Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau.